Hello and welcome to the session on an introduction to phenomenology. The origins of phenomenology in the 20th century. Phenomenology is the term applied to a branch of specialization in western philosophy. It also refers to a movement in philosophy or a philosophical tradition that originated in Germany in the 20th century. Edmund Gustav Albrecht Husserl, better known as Edmund Husserl, a philosopher and mathematician was the founder of phenomenology as a school of philosophy. The origins of phenomenology can be traced to the publication of Husserl's logical investigations in 1901. Following the publication of his book, Husserl gave a series of five lectures at Gotting in which he explained the development of the phenomenological method and its potential uses. The method that Husserl developed is called phenomenological reduction or epistemological reduction. These lectures have been published under the title Idea of Phenomenology in 1907 in German. The complete English translation was published a long time after in 1964. It was these lectures that helped Husserl raise phenomenology to the status of an esteemed branch of philosophy in the early 20th century. In the third lecture of the idea of phenomenology, Husserl defines phenomenology as the science of pure phenomena. He also adds that we must not stop at the point where we have made sense of phenomena or objects of consciousness. Instead, we must go ahead and ask how do we know what we know? How is knowledge of a thing possible? For Husserl, phenomenology as a method had to be extended to understanding how knowledge was produced. In other words, it had to be applied to a critic of knowledge, meaning it had to offer a theory of the possibility and condition of knowledge. Although phenomenological thinking began with Edmund Husserl and other German philosophers at the universities of Gotting and Freiburg, the movement later spread to France. England and the USA where it was applied to studies in religion, mathematics, logic, etc. Husserl has exerted a great deal of influence on several philosophers and philosophical movements in the 20th century. Martin Heidegger, Jean Paul Sartre, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Roman Ingarden, Gottlob Frege, Max Scheller, Emmanuel Levinas, Paul Ricoeur, Jacques Derrida and Hans Blumenberg. Following the rise to power of the Nazis in 1933 in Germany, Husserl was suspended from the University of Freiburg where he had taught for a long time. He was also prohibited involvement in any academic activities. Phenomena in Phenomenology The word phenomenology comes from the Greek term phenomenon meaning that which appears and logos meaning study. It literally means the study of phenomena or appearances as it is known in phenomenology. Science is also the study of phenomena. How then is phenomenology different from science? Science looks at phenomena as existences not appearances. Existence means that things exist before or after we are aware of them. Therefore, there are things in the world that exist and that we are not aware of. Science assumes that objects exist or events occur whether or not we know that they do, whether we experience them or not. These objects and events are truths or facts that exist independent of our knowledge or experience of them. They exist before we experience them. In other words, scientific thinking tells us that we sense, see, hear, smell, taste, think, things or objects because they are around us. For instance, we see a tree because the tree exists, we feel the wind because it blows, uproots trees, scatters dust, etc. We experience reality because reality exists. For science, 
then our knowledge or experience of an object is a property of that object. Science has an objective view of reality. It works on the principle that it is possible to study objects as they exist and as they are by themselves. While science studies phenomena as reality defined outside our experience of it, philosophy studies reality in two ways. It reflects on the nature of reality and also on the relationship between the mind and reality. For phenomenologist, reality is not given. It is not a free gift of God or nature. On the contrary, reality is what we take it to be. Phenomena for these philosophers are not facts as they are for natural scientists. They are the appearances of objects or events or objects and events as we experience them. By appearance is meant anything, whether material and concrete or abstract and intangible that we are conscious of that can be cognized. Reality is only an appearance, it is only what we experience and consider as reality, it is not a pre-given fact. Our knowledge then of objects and events is a property of our mind or as Husserl states our consciousness and not of objects themselves. We know things not as they are, but as what we think they are. The idea is best summarized in the famous statement by René Descartes, I think therefore I exist. Phenomenology emphasizes the role of experience or consciousness in the knowledge of objects. It is concerned with how we know what we know. It therefore has a subjective view of reality. In other words, a first person point of view of reality. We must however not assume that all branches of philosophy share phenomenology's notion of the relationship between experience and reality. Such fields in philosophy as ontology are concerned primarily with the question of existence or reality. The basic ontological questions are what is reality and what is existence. In other words, ontology is interested in things as they are or what is called the state of being. Phenomena and its categories. Phenomenology may be broadly defined as the study of appearances. It is time for us to consider what appearances mean. When we use the term appearance in our everyday conversations, there is an indication of illusion in it. We often use the term appearance to refer to something that is not real. When we say appearances are deceptive, we mean that they are just illusions and that there is truth hidden behind them. So, illusions are false representations of the real. We are in such situations actually talking of reality and illusion at the level of object. There can be real objects and illusory ones. But for phenomenology, appearances mean something else. By an appearance is meant any existence that has an effect on our consciousness. It can be a concrete object or abstraction that affects our thinking or makes a difference to our cognition. It does not matter whether the existence is real or only an illusion. This however is not to say that phenomenology does not distinguish between the real and the illusory. The properties of the real and the illusory for phenomenology are not inherent within the object or abstraction. It is consciousness that distinguishes between the two and classifies an appearance as real or illusory. Such distinction involves a complex process that consist of inductive and deductive methods of reasoning and logic. At this stage in our discussion, we see that our consciousness involves two phases. It first experiences an object or event which constitute phenomena or appearances. In other words, everything is an appearance at the first level. It is only in the next phase that consciousness distinguishes between reality and illusion. Appearances include several categories. They are to begin with objects of perception. 
Objects of perception are also called percepts. They are material phenomena that can be perceived through the senses. Material phenomena include visual phenomena, light, colors, objects, etc. that can be seen with the physical eye. Auditory phenomena, sounds that can be heard through the ears. Olfactory and gustatory experiences, odors and smells sensed in the nose and flavors sensed in the mouth and the tongue or the taste organs and tactile phenomena sensed in touch. Percepts can also be phenomena in the mental domain. Mental phenomena are appearances resembling material phenomena but are not perceived through the senses. They are imaginations or projections that may be involuntary or voluntary including memories of events in the recent or distant past and projections of the present or future events. Take the case of a car. A car has a physical existence in the world. Therefore, it is present in the physical domain. But there is also an image of a car in our consciousness, in our stored memory, in our mental domain. When we say we want to buy a new car, we do not have to point to a car existing in the world at the time of our conversation. The person we are talking to has an image of a car in his or her mind just like we do. Communication takes place because for both the participants a car has a meaning in their consciousness. The projection of the present or the future is known as anticipation. Anticipation suggests that what we experience in the present moment will have some sort of continuation in the future. For instance, when we study something we anticipate that this will have its continuation in the next chapters and finally the exam. A second category of appearances consists of objects of intuition. To define it in simple terms, intuition is self-knowledge. Like perceptions, intuitions are also experiences of something that is a concrete appearance. Objects of intuition are a particular set of abstractions like the self and the other and desires, judgments. Every person has a sense of his or self as I me and mine, while also of another person as the other. This sense does not come from merely looking at oneself or others in the mirror. It comes from a level of consciousness deeper than the level of senses. In other words, the sense of self and the other does not evolve only because of one's experience of his or her physical existence as in the case of the car. These senses work at a different level of consciousness. A person has his or her own cognition. I know what I am thinking, volition. I know that it was my will to do it and I did it. Imagination and valuation. This shirt is not good for me. I like this car. All these acts of cognition, volition, judgment make the I that does them at the center of experience or consciousness. A third category includes objects of conception. Objects of conception are those that help us to formulate abstract categories or concepts that are used to make sense of our experience of the world. We use concepts to describe, classify and compare phenomena. A circle is a symbol object of conception. A circle is the concept we have constructed to explain our experience of a rounded object the moon for instance or an orange. It is not simply a word that corresponds with an object or event in the real world. There are very complex objects of conception like society or politics or economy etc. that help us make sense of our collective experiences of objects and events in the world. We mostly formulate concepts through the process of deduction and induction. Both Deduction and induction are explained as organizing principles of knowledge in the next section. The organizing principles of knowledge are the transformation of phenomena from experience to knowledge. The basic idea of phenomenology is that knowledge is based on appearance. To have an effect on consciousness, to make a difference to cognition is essentially to know. Thus, we see that the phenomenological notion of knowledge is opposed to science view of knowledge. Science works with the assumption that knowledge can be produced on the basis of existing reality. 
The basic condition required for knowledge in science is the existence of phenomena. For phenomenology, on the other hand, the fundamental condition of knowledge is consciousness. It investigates how consciousness produces knowledge. It asks how do we proceed from experience to knowledge in consciousness. This question cannot be answered without understanding with what is consciousness and how consciousness works. Phenomenology deals with the structures of consciousness in the act of production of knowledge. The core process involved in this transition from experience to knowledge is organization. This means organization of experiences in a certain sequence or order so as to transform them into knowledge. There are several organizing principles that arrange experiences or phenomena into distinctive sequences or a logical order of things or events. The simplest organizing principles are acts of comparison and contrast or apprehensions of sameness and difference. We know that a tree is a tree because it can be compared to another tree and distinguished from a building which is not a tree. Our previous experiences accumulated over time of trees and buildings already processed into knowledge serves as a mental map to help us to compare and contrast. This map which we call memory contains the logical order required to know that it is a tree. When we see a tree or think of a tree, there is simultaneously an activation of this logical order in our consciousness. If for some reason as a result of an accident or mental illness for example, our consciousness fails to activate this logical order, we would not be able to distinguish a tree as a tree and not as building. Our physical eyes might see the tree, but it does not make a difference to our cognition. Our consciousness does not process this experience for us to know that it is a tree. Similarly, causality is another organizing principle. Causality is the relationship between an event that occurs first and an event that occurs later. The first event becomes the cause of the second, which is the effect. The second event is a consequence of the first. Our consciousness links the two events in a sequence as the first, second, third, etc., where there is no such connection. Connection itself is not a concrete phenomenon or an intuitive experience. It is made in our consciousness. In fact, it comes only as a second step in our order of consciousness. A third organizing principle is measurement. Measurement is use of a number. It involves three stages a selection of a unit. A unit is a single entity or object identifying and counting pluralities of such units or frequencies and comparing such pluralities or proportion. We use number to mark time and space or objects in space. To define a unit of something we must be able to limit the boundaries of what appears to us and focus on one segment of it. Let us say we are in a garden which has a row of trees. The garden as a whole can affect our consciousness, so can just one tree. If we wish to count trees, we begin by limiting the boundaries of the garden and focusing on a single tree. When we count a plurality of trees, we first need to distinguish the tree from other objects say a pole or a lamp post. In other words, we must group them using a feature common to them all or classify them. Similarly, deduction and induction are two other organizing principles. Deduction is when we begin with a common feature like in the case of the tree discussed above in thought and apply it to phenomena that we experience. A branch is a feature common to trees broadly speaking. Therefore, a branch defines the concept of the tree. When we observe branches in five individual trees around us, we apply the concept of the tree to these five trees. Since all of them have branches, they are all trees. Induction is a much more gradual and complex process of trial and error. We observe a group of objects that have some features in common, but we are not quite sure of what all those common features are to come up with a definition or concept for the group. Yet, we give the group a name and keep them together for some time. 
we might put this set of common features away for another set. This is because we might find that the set first identified is not common to all of the group and therefore not sufficient to form a definition. We come up with a third or fourth set. The process goes on until we identify a set of common features that are sufficient to formulate a concept or a definition. Let us summarize the major points in this session. In this unit, we looked at the origins of phenomenology as a branch of specialization in philosophy with its founder Edmund Husserl. We tried to distinguish between the scientific approach to phenomena and the phenomenological approach to it. We looked at the three principal types of appearances or phenomena or objects of consciousness, objects of perception, intuition and conception. We understood how knowledge is produced in various phases from experience to its final product which is knowledge. We also explained the organizing principles that help to transform experience into knowledge. Now try to answer the given questions. Number 1. How does science understand phenomena? Number 2. What is the basic question in ontology? Number 3. Discuss the importance of logical order in knowledge formation. Number 4. What is the relationship between reality and consciousness in phenomenology? Number 5. What does phenomenology emphasize as fundamental to knowledge? You can refer given books for more details. Phenomenology Basic Knowledge on Appearance by Avision, Geneva, 2003. Introduction to Phenomenology by Dermot Moran, Routledge Publications, London, 2000. Phenomenological Explanations by Alfonso Lingis, Martinus Nijoff Publishers, Lancaster, 1986. Thank you for watching this program. Goodbye.